Hello guys, welcome back to another tutorial. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to do NPC dialogue. I've got two examples over here. I've got the fellow on the right. If we go close to this player, we get a prompt to push E. If we choose to push E, he will give us a random response. So if we push E again, it's a random number of things that this NPC can say to us based on the choice of the computer. If we go to the other fella, this guy is going to give us a programmed response and tell us a story. So he's going to say he's heard about a village not too far from here. They say it has riches beyond a common man's dreams, but it's guarded by many enemies. So we've got one NPC that gives us random responses and one that gives us a pre-programmed three-line response based on our button taps. Let me show you how it works. I'm Xanderwood. I make indie games and tutorials on game development. I also play your indie games every week on my channel. Make sure you subscribe and click that bell icon so you never miss a video. And before we continue with the video, just a massive thank you and a shout out to my wonderful Patreon and YouTube channel members, Fuzel CC, Olivia Bernier, Jared Dumont, Retro Galaxy, Matt, Lighting Cat, Jonathan Turner, Seth Goebel, Fan Van, Martin K, Nikki Harbour, Yanni Boy, Amari Lewis, Ahmad Fermansaya, Julian Cruz, Rob, Mood for Sale, Charcoal, Tor Alex Anderson, and Enmark Games. Thanks for supporting my game dev journey and for more information about what's on offer in the Patreon, there's a link in the description. So in the event sheet, I've got two global variables. I've got an NCP, uh, an NPC variable, which determines which NPC we are talking to, be it the one on the left or the one on the right. And we have a global variable called NPC1 dialogue stage. So NPC1 is the fellow on the left, and that's going to track his dialogue stage. So based on what that number says, it's going to give us a different response when we push the E button. Now, if we open up the setup dialogue collisions group, We've got an on start of layout, and what we've done is set some array variables. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do, if you've not already added it, is add an array. You can double click, and in data and storage, you'll see this array icon. Double click, add that one in there, and it's going to pop up in your objects folder. Once you have it in your game, you can then reference it in the code. So, on start of layout, you can select array, and what you're looking to do on that array is set x, set a value at x. Arrays can be X, Y, and Z, which is height, width, and depth. But for this dialogue tutorial, we're just going to use the X variable. So we're going to set four values to this array at value zero. And imagine this is a column going from top to bottom. In fact, if I show you the debug, it's probably an easier way to understand it. If we come over and click on the array here, you can see in the data section here, we've got zero, one, two, three, four, all the way down to nine. Um, I've left, I haven't changed mine. That's why it says nine, but you can change it to whatever you want it to say. In fact, we can go and do that in a second. But at every single one of these, you can add in a different uh, a different response or a different different amounts of data, whatever it is that you want to add in there. It's basically like a, a big bucket with many different lines that you can store things in. If I go ahead and click on my array in the objects type over here, and I come over to the left in the properties, I can see the width is 10, the height is 1, the depth is 1. Um, I actually don't need 10. We can change that to 4 because we've only got four different command, uh, different options in that variable. Uh, and those options are, hello, my friend, can I help you? Are you lost? Welcome to our village. You can put as many of those in as you want to. And these are all just going to be the random responses that we're going to pick from when we talk to that NPC. The next thing I've got going on is in every tick. So every single frame of the game, we're going to set that prompt sprite to the character's X position. And that prompt sprite is this one here. And all this is is just a sprite that I've made with the letter E in it. And all I'm doing is setting it to the X position of the player. So even though you can't see it when I play the game, it's still following my X position and it just becomes visible when we get close enough to these other players. Enemies, pick nearest to the player character. So we're gonna pick the enemy that's nearest to the player and we're gonna set that NPC to enemies.id. And what that enemies.id is, is the local variable in these enemies. So if you look at these enemies here, I've given them an instance variable called ID. They both have it because they're the, both the same object. And I've put the left one at zero and I've put the right one at one. So what this line of code here does is whichever, whichever one of these enemies we're closest to, it's gonna set this global variable at the top here, which I've used to track my NPC to the enemy's ID, which is either zero or one, which is that, that ID, that local uh, variable in the enemy. Once we've done that, we're going to do a sub event and we're going to check a few more things. We're going to check the player's X position to the enemy. So we're going to see if the player is greater than the enemy's X minus 32. And we're also going to see if the player's X position is less than the enemy's X plus 32, which gives us a 64 pixel window either side of the enemy that we can be within for that 
prompt variable to set visible. We're only going to check that visible if the player is on the floor. So if I come over to the enemies here, I'm within that 64 pixel gap either side. If I jump, it disappears because I don't want that to follow me. I don't want to be able to talk to the uh, the the player there if the enemy is if the player is jumping. So it's only going to register if the player is on the floor. And then I've set an else variable here. So if none of that's true then we're going to set that prompt variable invisible, which means it's going to be invisible at any point that we're not within those distances of either of those players. In the controls group, I've got the on keyboard press. Now, if you don't have the keyboard added, you're going to have to double click and you're going to have to come down to inputs. And you'll see it in here next to the gamepad, the touch and the mouse. I've got the mouse and the keyboard in mind. You're not going to need the mouse for this tutorial, but you can add the keyboard. That way we can reference it in the event sheet. On keyboard pressed E and I've set a condition to this because I only want that to be um, an option if the prompt is visible because if the prompt's visible I know we're close enough to the enemies to talk to them. So if the prompt is visible when we press the E button we're then going to run a check and see which NPC character we're talking to because remember I set the NPC global variable based on the enemy that I'm closest to's local ID. So I already know whether I'm at the left enemy or the right one. So if the NPC is equal to one, then I'm going to add in this line of code here, which is a simple text box. So I've set this text box here. It's called dialogue text. I'm going to set that dialogue text to choose an answer from our array. And the way I've done that is by using the choose expression and I've set it to choose either array at zero, array at one, array at two, and array at three. And if you want to add more in, you just need to add in those extra arrays and put those numbers corresponding to the position in the array that those text responses are at. I've set that to typewriter text over the, over the space of one second. And if we're talking to NPC number zero, then I'm running another check which determines which stage of dialogue we are at. Now, if we're at stage zero, which we're defaulted to, which means we haven't talked to him before, then we are going to write that first line of code. I heard about your village not far from here. If we're at stage one, we're going to progress the text. And if we're at stage two, we're going to progress it again. And you can effectively progress this as many times as you want to. What I've done is every time the E button is pressed, I've come down to the bottom here and set another blank sub event. So when all of this has finished running, we're going to add one to the dialogue stage. So even though we're pushing E, as long as that um, prompt variable is visible, we're going to add one to the dialogue stage, which means every time we push it, we're going to get a different response. Now, in order to reset that NPC dialogue stage, I've gone down to the bottom here and said if the prompt is not visible, which effectively will mean we've moved away from either of those other characters, then we're going to set the speech bubble, which is this blank white tile, uh, very, uh, tile background, and we're going to set the dialogue box invisible, and we're going to set the NCP dialogue stage back to zero. So that means if we walk away and go back, we're already at the beginning stage of that dialogue tree. Now I've set this other event down here, which says system if the NPC dialogue stage is greater than two, which means we've cycled through the dialogue once, then set the stage back to zero, which means it will just go back to the first message. And then to determine which one of these um, to determine which one of these dialogue boxes and speech bubbles are to go visible, I've just set it to pick the one nearest to the player, which simply means that the other one will remain invisible. And that's it. Two simple groups, two simple global variables. And I've got a dialogue system where I can get a programmed, pre-programmed dialogue tree using an array or a random response from another one another NPC. If you've enjoyed the tutorial guys, please feel free to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. It really does help out the channel and it helps me continue to make more wonderful videos just like this one. If you've got a suggestion for a future tutorial, then I have a discord with a channel in it where you can leave your tutorial suggestions. That's it for now and I'll see you in the next video.